I know it always takes me a second to get this thing fired up and, um, you know, get your headphones on and, and all that kind of good stuff. So at, uh, let's say two past two, we will begin in everybody. Um, my name is Brandon Butler. I am the law and policy advisor to the Software Preservation Network, and I'm also the director of information policy here in beautiful University of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. Um, in addition to the various titles I just described, I'm also a member of the Code of Best, pra Best Practices Research Team, uh, the uh, uh, project that we're mainly going to be focusing on today. And we're really proud to bring to you today, March 11th, the third episode in our seven-part series of webinars, Exploring the Fair Use Code and Other Legal Tools for Software Preservation, uh, co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. So uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, everyone but the hosts and guests will be muted throughout the webinar. That helps make sure we have audio and visual quality that is nice for recording purposes and for everyone who's watching. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please just type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. Uh, you should be able to find the chat option somewhere in that uh, interface that you're looking at. I'll bring up these questions during the presentation. Uh, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So I'll manage the questions. Don't worry about the questions. They'll come through me. And uh, every episode is going to be recorded, transcribed, and posted to the SPIN website, uh, free, freely available for all to enjoy. So um, this recording is something that you can share with your friends when it's, when it's ready. Um, today we are presenting episode three, uh, Access Within Organizations and Across Networks. Uh, and our guests are Jonathan Farbowitz, who is a fellow in the conservation of computer-based art uh, at the Guggenheim Museum. He, he, he assists the Guggenheim Conservation Department in addressing the preservation needs of computer-based works in the Guggenheim's collection. Jonathan also supports the development of best practices like these uh, for collecting and managing these kinds of artworks. Uh, Farbowitz has worked on the restoration of Shu Lei Chang's Brandon, 1998-1999, and John F. Simon Jr.'s Unfolding Object, 2002. He holds an MA in Moving Archiving and Preservation from New York University, as well as a BA from Vassar College, and has previous experience in software development and testing. Uh, our next guest today is Ewan Cochran. Uh, Ewan is the Digital Preservation Manager at Yale University Library, where he leads a team that preserves digital assets from across the libraries, archives, and museums on campus. Uh, he is also the primary investigator on the EASY program of work and has been an emulation advocate uh, and user since the mid-1990s when he was active in the Amiga emulation scene. Uh, I was at that time active in the bulletin board system debates about rock music scene. So um, your research leads and facilitators for this episode are Krista Cox, who is the Director of Public Policy Initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries. And Krista is joined by Peter Yazi, uh, Professor Emeritus at American University Washington College of Law. Professor Yazi is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices Movement and is a co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices along with myself, Pat Alfredi, and Peter's co-host, Krista Cox. Um, so in this episode, Krista, Peter, Jonathan, and Ewan are going to discuss how fair use enables institutions to provide access to software for use in research, teaching, and learning purposes, while minimizing any negative impact uh, on ordinary uh, commercial interests of our software friends um, and maximizing research possibilities for the people who need our institution. And we're also going to talk about going beyond one institution to provide broader networked access uh, to software maintained and shared across multiple institutions. So you'll hear a little bit about those two principles uh, from Krista and Peter, and then you'll hear from some experiences in the field from Jonathan and Ewan, and then we'll have time for those four folks to have a discussion amongst themselves as well as some questions and answers from you all. So. Uh, without any further ado, let me just make sure I have the chat window visible to me. 
so I can moderate your chats. And again, drop your questions in the chat anytime, and I'll keep track of them. And I'll turn the uh, keys over to Krista and Peter. Uh, thank you so much, Brandon. Um, and thank you to our guests, Ewan and Jonathan, for joining us today. Uh, as, um, as Brandon explained, we're going to be discussing a high-level overview of scenarios three and four from the code. If you were able to join us um, in our previous webinar episodes, first we gave uh, an overview of a very high-level overview of the code itself, as well as these um, codes of best practices. And last week, we talked about scenarios one and two, which were really about preservation, about collecting and stabilizing and um, evaluating the legacy software and documenting that in, um, in its operation. Today, we're going to be talking about the two scenarios of the code that deal with um, the other half of the mission of cultural heritage institutions, mainly about access. Um, so the scenario that I'm going to give a brief overview on is providing access to for use in research, teaching, and learning. Of course, it's important to remember that um, this code is really about access to legacy software. Um, and we are talking about in this scenario about providing access using um, uh, you know, on-site physical terminals or remotely accessible online technologies such as emulation because otherwise if we were providing access to the original media and hardware, um, that could place those resources at risk because these are often older materials and we don't want to see those deteriorate or become lost. Um, and with these on-site physical terminals um, or remote access technologies, we're able to provide them um, to a broader, perhaps to a broader range of people without creating these limits that the original media might have. Um, the other reason for providing access in these ways is it allows for interoperable programs to be run together. Um, and while some uh, commercial vendors have created uh, rendering tools, sometimes they don't faithfully represent how those objects um, originally ran or looked in the now obsolete formula, um, formats. So uh, this is really about providing access to the legacy software that is preserved um, and being made available for research and study and teaching and learning. Um, so the principle states that providing controlled access to software, um, fair use applies to providing controlled access to software in support of research, teaching, and learning. Uh, like all of the scenarios, we um, heard about limitations that, that strengthen the uh, case for fair use. So if we could go to the next slide covering limitations. Great, so these are the limitations that apply to scenario three. Um, the first one, of course, is that individuals granted access to collection software should be notified that access is provided for teaching or research purposes, and they personally are responsible for ensuring that any further uses are lawful. Um, we Memory institutions do the same thing, for example, when um, providing access to a photocopier. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that the individuals that are using it, that they are responsible for um, making sure that they're, they're making lawful uses when they access the software. Um, the second limitation is where a preservation institution intends to provide only controlled access, it should take appropriate measures to limit the possibility of users copying or otherwise retaining that software. So um, if you're providing it on an on-site physical terminal, you don't want, if, if the intention is to keep it limited, you don't want the users to be able to uh, download it. Um, and then the third one is uh, access to commercially available software should be restricted to minimize impact on ordinary commercial sales. Uh, for example, um, it might be enabled on a case-by-case -case basis for limited purposes that are not served by commercial offerings such as data verification and reproducibility studies subject to the user's affirmative agreement to reasonable terms and conditions. Um, we give another example. Uh, another approach could be to limit access to commercially available software to local terminals that limit how the software can be used or copied because, of course, um, an important part of fair use, uh, the, the fourth factor, is the impact on, um, on the market. So we want to, uh, this, this limitation is intended to minimize that impact on um, the, the market for commercial sales. 
So that is scenario three. I'll turn it over now to Peter to describe scenario four. Great, thank you, Krista. Uh, I thought I'd start by talking just a tiny bit about the methodology by which this code of best practices was developed. As, as we've mentioned in, in previous sessions, the first thing that the research team did was to talk to a lot of people who are active in the field, including many of you, to find out what their, their concerns were, what the recurrent situations in which they found that they were bumping up or at least rubbing up against uh, real or perceived copyright problems were like. And the results of that interview phase are summarized in the first report that we issued that is on the ARL website and other places. And maybe, maybe we can put a link to it up in the chat now. And then we went ahead and having distilled all that information into a set of, of recurrent situations, things that seem to come up again and again, we convened the small discussion groups around the country, which we've mentioned, again, in, in which some of you were generous enough to participate and tried to work out consensus ideas about what made sense as good practice in each of those situations. One of the things we heard about again and again from the first day of our activities, literally, was the, 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 the promise and problem, if you will, of shared emulation tools. Obviously, emulation has its, has its limitations as a tool, but it's enormously powerful. And at the same time, when you have many institutions working in the field, each with its own specializations, each with its own collection, there's a risk of, of both duplication and lack of access in the community as a whole to a full range of emulation tools. So almost from the beginning, we heard about the project of doing emulation as a service. And I would say that of, of all of the initiatives in the field, which we had a chance to talk with you experts about, this is probably the one that, that rang at least initially the largest number of, of, of copyright bells, so to speak. So we were very hopeful that in the consensus building part of our project, we could address it successfully in a way that would responsibly enable the potential power of this solution. And in addition to hearing in, in our discussions a lot about how promising and important emulation was about how essential it was to enable communities of institutions working in different parts of the software preservation field to share emulation software. We also heard, and this is something that Krista has just adverted to, real concern expressed about doing all, doing this as, as was true of, of all of the initiatives we discussed in a way that was respectful of existing functioning commercial software markets. And that sensitivity, which was widely shared among the, in our, those who were willing to work with us at both stages of our project, grew perhaps partly out of some understanding of the importance of market factors and fair use analysis, as Krista has suggested. It also grew, I think, about a, out of a genuine indwelling sense on the part of people who work in software preservation that their mission should be consistent with rather than in conflict with the mission of both individual and corporate software developers. 
So that turned it out to be a big part of what we thought about in connection with both principle three, as Krista has described, and principle four. And we think it's, and hope that it's well reflected in the results. The most important thing that I would say to you about this principle or situation, number four, is in addition to what is on the next slide, and I guess we can, we can move to that now, I would urge you, in addition to looking at the, the slide information, to have a look back at the Code of Best Practices itself uh, as we gave you a link to it at the beginning of this webinar session, and to look carefully at the, the description of the situation that precedes the principle, as you've just seen it, and these limitations about which I'm going to uh, uh, speak in a moment. He, this, is, this is, I think, a particularly important part of the code because as our discussions developed, it was very clear to us that everyone who was working with us in the small groups was thinking of providing emulation software to students, researchers, and others online as a cooperative, a collective, a uh, consortial activity. And so we have described this activity in those terms in the code because they were the terms in which the groups with which we were speaking about it conceived of it. And that, that description, that conceptualization is in turn directly reflected in the four limitations that you see on the screen before you. And the, it's obvious in the first of those, which assumes the existence of some kind of consortial framework in which the sharing of emulation tools is going to take place. If it weren't for that assumption, then discussions of, of MOUs and the like wouldn't make any sense. It is in the context of that assumption that we think they do. Another thing that we were told at every stage of the discussion was that although consortial arrangements were the way to go in terms of making specialized emulation software more available to a wider range of teachers, scholars, researchers, and others. This had to be done in terms of our, our prescriptions about fair use in ways that were sensitive to the fact that in any consortium, there are going to be different kinds of institutions with different collections, different resources, and different values. And so all of these limitations are cast with that assumption in mind. None of them, as you can see, recommends a particular set of practices that will be governing or binding on every institution in any particular consortium. All of them instead recommend objectives that the practices that consortia will devise and implement within themselves should be designed to achieve. And the first of those goals is reflected in limitation B, that is policies should be put in place about how to extend the reach of collection material within a given institution, but beyond the physical reading room. And then again, in limitation C, cooperative or consortial arrangements designed to share emulation tools should get together and talk about who is included and who is excluded potentially from such arrangements and create mechanisms that will assure that non-affiliated scholars have a way into the richness that these consortial repositories of software and in particular of emulation tools will create. And then finally, 
And again, there are many ways to do this, just as there are many ways to accomplish the goals that are stated in B and C above. Finally, and as was true of every element of this list of limitations, so it is true here that the level of consensus within our small groups about this proposition was extremely high and extremely consistent. That is, if one is going to be putting material online for use by institutional affiliates and under supervision, also by non-affiliated researchers, it's really, really important to give rights holders a mechanism by which if they see something going on, which they think constitutes a meaningful challenge to their you know, zone of exclusivity, they can say so. Um, this is not, and I want to repeat, not a takedown policy. We're not recommending that institutions or consortia that are going to share material online set up hard and fast rules that say that in the event of receiving any complaint from a rights holder, they will immediately do X, Y, or Z. Rather, the recommended strongly recommended policy here is to create an easy, transparent mechanism by which concerns and I suppose also conceivably, if it were to come to pass, complaints could be registered. That they can then be processed, some will be legitimate, some will not, but the tool, the channel, the conduit is essential. So I, I think I'll stop there, turn it back over to Brandon, and then I'll look forward to trying to answer with, with Krista and, and others of the team any questions you may have about these extremely important, I might even argue, um, the most important principles of the Code of Best Practices. Great. Thanks, Peter. And so let's see, we're not quite ready for questions yet. Let's go to, uh, I had Ewan next on my agenda. So Ewan, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours. If that works. That's good. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, Peter. I will just start sharing here. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and um, not take up too much time here because I'm conscious that it'd be great to have some good um, discussion. Um, I'm going to show a few examples of how we uh, can use the rights described in the, in the Fair Use Code to, um, to ensure that we can still access old content that has a software dependency um, or that we can interact with it or, or what have you. So I'll start just by showing a few examples. This is some research I did when I was at Archives New Zealand, um, where we opened uh, old files, old born digital files, then the original software, then in modern software, and then in emulated versions of the original. And we compared the differences. We had a very large uh, survey type tool where um, some students were going through and opening every environment and checking off all these different things that might have changed. Um, and we found quite a lot of uh, somewhat dramatic differences when we opened things in modern software versus the original. Um, so th and for this particular example, it's a Microsoft Works document. And um, here it is in Office, well, Word um, 2012, or the latest version of Word. Um, you can see, really, it's a mess. Um, but also, once you get down to the actual poem that's in here, the poem's still here. But when you open it in modern software, this chunk of text is added. Of course, all the word counts, as you can see down the bottom left here, uh, and the page length is also off. So if you wanted to cite something in here, it would, would be fairly problematic. Um, but this uncovering of the text here is particularly alarming. Um, and what it points to is that we really want to be able to open the, th the objects, born digital objects in the original software. There are a few more examples in this research, um, some data type ones. This one here was kind of interesting, a word perfect file where this is the original in WordPerfect uh, 5.1 for Windows, uh, Windows 3.1.1. Uh, 
And then this is the one, the same file opened after 2007. Interestingly, the new software interpreted the um, formatting information to put a private tag around the title here, which really changes your interpretation of that thing. And if this were a piece of evidence, you might um, treat it quite differently if you saw this private uh, on there than if you, it wasn't there. And it was not there in the original. And that's just using the wrong software to open the object. So if you're doing research on Born Digital Archives, I would, uh, I would say that we almost definitely want to have the option for every Born Digital object to be able to open it in the original interaction environment. Um, and we can do, now do that with, uh, let's see if I can move this, yes, with um, Emulation as a Service. So Emulation as a Service is um, a tool set that uh, I've been working on with the University of Freiburg for quite a few years. Um, they're the lead developers of this. And what it allows you to do is run emulators, which simulate older computers, and install software on them, and then access uh, those old computers, emulated old computers via a web browser. So here's an example of um, what we want to move towards with accessing born digital objects, where you click a link and it automatically opens the appropriate software um, with that file open within it. So we're seeing Windows 98 load and we should see Microsoft Works load that same file we just saw in uh, the more recent version of Microsoft Word. Here we go. And um, particularly important to point out is that we're then able to interact with it. Uh, digital objects, particularly born digital objects, are interactive. Having a printout of many of these things, especially things like spreadsheets, is, is not enough. We need to be able to go in and look at things like embedded metadata, um, look at spreadsheet formulas, um, and everything, and do anything you might have been able to do with the original software, just to see also what it was like for the original creator in, in creating these things. So you can see this is now interactive. I can go through and make changes. And, Fortunately, with emulation as a service, we can also restrict uh, various functionality. So when this uh, environment is shut down, if I click stop here, if I click that link again, it would reload exactly the same as it was before with no changes. So that's an example of being able to open a um, born digital object and interact with it using the original software. Um, I wrote a blog post, which uh, the link to this should be shared um, in the notes. Um, about designing what we're calling a universal virtual interactor, which is basically the functionality you just saw, where you could click a file and open it in the original software in your web browser. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into developing this. Um, for example, we need to set up an environment, which means um, a, a computer, a virtual computer that's running every piece of software out there that we might want to use to be able to interact with the file. And we need to document each of those environments very thoroughly in order to automate this process that's outlined in this blog post. Um, all of that work is really time consuming and somewhat costly, but it only needs to be done once. And this then relates to the, the second section of the, or section four, I believe, of the um, fair use code. Um, by outlining that under fair use, um, we're able to um, share these environments, these, these working computers that have the software pre-configured on them amongst consortia of organizations. It means that everyone can benefit from the work that one organization does to configure and document an environment and um, add it to a, a UVI like this or just add it to a shared pool that others can then use, add their content to, and re-enable access and interaction with that, that old object. There's all sorts of objects, of course, pretty much anything born digital, this would apply to, including things like um, email archives, where you might want to open in the original, um, like an, a PST file, an email archive in the original Outlook, and have the other applications there, which is another point to make, that um, often we want to be able to use multiple applications in the same environment because there are multiple dependencies for a particular object. I'll show you one more example here, which is a... Um, some research data that's associated with this study that was done at, um, by these folks here. And it's archived in the Institute for Social Policy Studies data archive here at Yale. If I go over here, we have downloaded all the files that are at the bottom of that um, page here and attach them to an environment that includes all of the so software dependencies. So it includes um, Stata, R, Excel, uh, and an, a PDF reader. Um, and what's really good about this is um, 
if you're a scientist and you wanted to reproduce the outputs that are published with that study, you can go and um, load up this environment, rerun the, the code in Stator and see that it does produce the exact same output. And you might want to tweak that code or you might eventually want to add some um, different data to it and rerun it. And by having the software all there packaged up and ready to go in your browser, you're able to reproduce it very easily without um, much effort at all. And of course, once we set up this one environment with all those dependencies, there goes the um, uh, operating system startup sound. But once we set up this environment with all the dependencies, we can then share that um, and reuse it for all of the other uh, publications that have the same dependencies. So I'm opening up this data do file and it's starting to run. What we'll find is the, um, the output is already in there. Um, so it'll give us an error saying it can't write to the output once it gets to the end of this. But you can see that it's redoing, it's rerunning that code and reproducing the same results as it did previously. Let's see, the file already exists. Um, but as well as looking in there, we can say open up this Excel file. We can look at the documentation that's in this PDF. It's all there. Um, all the dependencies are there in a single environment. You don't need to move out of the space. This must have been a big Excel file. All right. So the one other thing that um, we're doing, uh, one more example I'll show actually is we've been setting up, we've been imaging all the CD-ROMs in our general collections. CD-ROMs that almost, many of them, they're, they're CD-ROM publications that many other libraries also have a copy of. Um, and we're attaching them to dedicated uh, environments and configuring any software that's on there. Here's an example, um, but what we do after that then is we um, put a link in our catalog to these landing pages. Uh, and the landing page has all the information, all the interaction buttons that a user would need. But basically it, it automatically loads into the environment and you'll see the software. Um, in this case, a UN, a UN um, publication about landmines. A lot of audio on these, so I'm going to use that tab. But um, yeah, it, it loads automatically, so the user can interact with it like they would have originally. And from for anyone that might be doing any research in, say, the UN or landmines or anything to do with this, being able to re-access this thing, which does not work on modern operating systems, um, is just invaluable. But I think a couple of important aspects to the technology behind this that I should point out. One is that. The way emulation works, we're able to, for each of these objects, assign a limit to how many um, instances can be run concurrently. So with the CD-ROMs, what we're doing is we're saying, we have one copy, so only one person can use this at a time. As soon as they're done, it'll be freed up and the next person can start using it. We can do that for any objects in the system. And there are a bunch of other different types of restrictions we can implement. So here, we can choose to turn off, on or off the ability to print from an environment. We can turn on or off internet access, and we can turn on or off the ability to add your own files um, to interact with in that software. By doing that, we're limiting the ability for people to use this old software in a kind of production basis and, and making sure that they do go and buy uh, new, new versions of software if they're actually using it for um, business purposes, because they won't be able to do the kind of things that they'd want to do if um, they were using it on an operational basis such as add content or download results of changes you've made to content. In addition, in an archival setting, it, uh, things like being able to turn on or off printing um, enable us to restrict uh, how much access users get to the content itself. So at worst, um, they could take a screenshot. But aside from that, um, they can't necessarily, unless we allow them, take any content out of these environments, including the software itself, which is important um, and um, something that's covered, as we heard just before, in the fair use uh, guidelines. And that's partly been um, informed by the fact that we can technologically do these things using this emulation as a service uh, software. Uh, did I have anything else? So um, one more thing quickly to point out is what you're seeing in here is the more recent version of emulation as a service, um, or the software that's being built as part of the easy program of work, which allows us to have an instance of emulation as a service where we keep some environments private. We can then choose to, um, if you click through, publish an environment, and that puts it in this public area. 
And the public area, the things in the public area are then shared to anybody that's networked in the emulation of the service um, infrastructure program um, to our node and they can choose to replicate it. So here we're seeing two environments that are at a remote node. I can um, go to the details and replicate it locally. That'll move it into the, the uh, public area on our node. That, that means that we can do a lot of work configuring environments and then we can share them with anyone else that's participating in this network of, of um, nodes. And it, it saves an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort for everybody involved. Um, and we're making quite a lot of progress with that at the moment and I'm hoping to give you more updates on that in future months. All right, I think that's all I had. Um, of course, I'll be happy to answer questions. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Ewan. Uh, and so now, Jonathan, if you want to take over, see if you sure. can... Sure. Let me just uh, unmute everything. Can you all see me? Yes. Okay. So um, thank you, Ewan. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm Jonathan Farbowitz. I'm the Guggenheim's Fellow in the Conservation of Computer-Based Art. And what you're seeing behind me, this is the Guggenheim's Media Conservation Lab. Um, so this is where we deal with um, time-based media artworks, which could include uh, films, uh, video art, audio, and of course, software-based art. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, strange, I don't, s oh, here we go. Okay. So... I'm going to share my browser with you. And so my fellowship is um, part of this larger initiative um, called the Conserving Computer-Based Art Initiative. And um, this is one of the blog posts that was written about it. So um, as part of my fellowship, um, I was tasked in dealing with um, what are now 26 computer-based works in the Guggenheim's collection. and um, so the, we have a variety of different preservation strategies for this for these works. Um, one of the strategies proposed being emulation, um, and also um, we have worked on two um, restorations, and these are these are restorations of web-based artworks. And the way that we we did this was through code migration, so translating the code from one programming language to another. Um, and so our, you know, our mandate as a museum is to preserve these software-based artworks for future exhibition um, and also for future researchers. <clears throat> and just to give you kind of a, a conceptual idea of, of the gamut that these software-based artworks run. So sometimes like in the picture I'm showing, uh, we could get um, an artwork that the artist provides a computer and that computer runs some artist produced software in a gallery. Um, we have three, as I mentioned, web artworks. So these were um, basically websites created as artworks. So we have to take care of those and those web artworks are expected uh, to be available on the internet 24 seven for anyone who goes to the website to be able to access them. And just to show you these web artworks, so this one is called Brandon. This is by the artist Shu Li Chang. Um, and this work was created in 1998. This is just the home page here. And um, I'm not going to go too far into it, but if you click on the Brandon link, you can um, get a, a sense of um, some of the different parts of the work. There's a bunch of different interfaces that you can visit. Um, I'll just, I guess I'll just go in here. And this is just one of the interfaces that you can interact with um, in work. Other web artwork that we have is Unfolding Object. And this one, um, you basically are presented with this square and you click on different pieces of the square and you unfold parts of it. And the lines that you're seeing is, are the artwork recording how many people have visited each of these, these paths, these uh, 
So um, the lines indicate how many people have traveled along the same path that I have. So these are the types of works that we're dealing with. And like Ewan mentioned in his presentation, we're very, very concerned with um, if we have a historic artwork, how this artwork would render in, um, can, in its historical software. We want um, the artwork to appear as faithfully as possible to the original artist's vision um, in the restorations that we did. So what you're seeing here in my browser, this is, a, this is now unfolding object. It was originally written in Java and we did a migration to JavaScript. So what you're seeing is um, the JavaScript code running underneath, but what, what it is, is it's an exact replication of what the artwork looked like originally. Um, so in terms of um, the code, um, if we think about, um, I actually wanted to step back for a minute and just look at um, situation two, because that's really important for us to be able to document software in operation and make that documentation available. We wrote um, two blog posts about our restorations. So if you look at the unfolding object blog post, we actually have um, a video here where we have the artist, um, he's interacting with the work. So um, in this case, um, you know, this particular work wasn't very challenging necessarily because Unfolding Object uses artist-written software. And of course, we, we have John F. Simon Jr.'s permission to work on this software. He was involved in the restoration process. But supposing um, in the future we would have something, uh, a web-based artwork with proprietary software, um, we'd want the ability to make research and documentation of that software running to be publicly available. <clears throat> and also in our um, blog post about Brandon, we also have another video down here, which is a, a video navigation of the work. And not only is this important for, for you know, making this, this information publicly available, but it's also important for our own internal research to have um, video of the software running, images of the software running, all those things. Um, and in some cases, um, the artists have used proprietary development environments such as Adobe Flash and uh, Macromedia Director to create artworks. And we have an, we have an ongoing collaboration with NYU um, where students, uh, NYU students actually study the works. This is some uh, NYU students participating in an artist interview. So um, you can imagine a situation in the future where you know, we want uh, the students or another researcher to be able to study something like a flash artwork and um, we have to you know, dig up that software or you know, perhaps an even older software in order to open the artwork and, and access it and make it available. Um, one could also imagine a situation in which um, we have to do a restoration of a web artwork that used proprietary software, in which case um, we would have to be able to you know, open that artwork in the software. Um, for example, um, the two web artworks that I showed you, they used um, Java applets, which is an older technology. And um, of course, we've kept the original versions of these artworks. So if a researcher wanted to see the original, the original running in Java, um, we'd have to figure out a way to do that. And the code would give us um, the confidence to say that um, we could, we could uh, use these older versions of Java, um, even if we didn't necessarily um, you know, have any kind of license with Oracle or anything like that. So um, I think that's all I have to say for the moment, but um, again, happy to um, answer any questions.
and I'll stop sharing. Wonderful. My awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, that's, these are such fascinating projects. That's been one of the best parts of this whole uh, code of best practices experience is just meeting people who are working on such cool things. So we've had several good questions in the chat so far, but before we go to questions from the uh, folks who are attending, I just wanted to open it up for Peter and Krista if they have any questions for Jonathan and Ewan before we move into audience questions. Hi, this is Peter. Um, not so much a question as just a thank you, because I think what both of these presentations help to demonstrate is the close relationship between the third and the fourth principles. They are, in effect, a, a, a cascading set of ideas. The third principle talks about what you can do to support academic and, and research and teaching work in your institution. And the fourth principle talks about, as, as, as both presenters so amply demonstrated, all of the potential that exists when and if one can share those tools more generally. So I couldn't have asked for, for better illustrations of, of the way we hope that these are going to be uh, empowering and and even even transformative for sure and i'll I'll add my gratitude and and the one thing one observation I think uh, another commonality across these two in some ways um, very different presentations is that the um, the necessity of access to older software for for something like fidelity, which is something that you need whether you're you know, uh, Ewan mentioned, you know, if you need something as evidence in a, in a case, um, which I know there are forensic uses of the software, or if you're a researcher trying to learn something about a document and understand it better, um, but also if you're restoring art and trying to present an artist's vision, fidelity matters. So, um, so I really appreciate that commonality. I think that's really interesting. Um, so I, we've got some great questions in the chat. So let's get to those. Um, the first question came from Drew Robarge, who asked, uh, whose commercial interests do we have to be concerned about? Um, so over, repeatedly in the code, there's expressed you know, concern about commercial interests. So Drew asked, let's say there's a digital market for old software that the copyright holder has no longer really been active in promoting, uh, say an old version or even abandoning the series. Would providing access be affecting the commercialization of a third party vendor? Uh, and similarly, what about physical vendors that sell old software, like original copies, I suppose, uh, for use on the original hardware? So what's the market here? Um, and this might be a good question for Peter uh, to start off with, and then maybe Krista can follow up. I'm happy to jump in because I think it's a question to which there's actually a fairly clear answer. And that is the, the markets about which our, our the participants in this process were concerned and the markets about which likewise lawyers are concerned in this area are the existing commercial markets that are being maintained on behalf of rights holders, not the kind of secondary markets that uh, you've described, which may be extremely valuable, maybe even very useful, which you may or may not want to respect in order to keep those people who are providing old software, even though they don't actually have any rights to do so in business, but it is not the kind of market interest to which the, the, the code looks as such. We're talking therefore about things that are in the market via the original developer or the original developer's current licensee. Yeah, I um, yeah, I I just I agree with Peter. Um, you know, I, I think that it, there's a difference between the market and the way the question seem to be phrased, um, which to me is like the market meaning that there are people who actually want it, but the um, rights holders are not making that available to that 
Um, so just because there is a want for something doesn't mean that the right holders see um, a market that they want to exploit. Ah, right. Yes, yes. When we talk about market, that's right. It's sort of uh, the, the core concern in fair use is always intruding and substituting for market demand where there's a, a right holder that, that, that is there and interested in, in supplying. And so across the board, we assume that there isn't a rights holder interested in supplying the rights holder who actually owns the material. Okay, great. And so our next question is... I point out <clears throat> one thing that's interesting in, in 3C, sure. the third, limit, third and final limitation to C, which of course, as I was saying earlier, carries over potentially into 4 because of the close relationship between these principles there, and I won't go further into it now, but I'd urge you to look at it. There, there is a description of the situation in which even software that is commercially available may be something that you can provide on a shared basis subject to some, some sensible restraints uh, under fair use. This is the 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 limitation that deals in particular with with data verification and reproducibility stuff. So everything we've said about what markets matter is right, but we shouldn't jump to the the further conclusion that just because there is a sustained market, fair use is therefore necessarily off the table. There's just more thinking to do in that case. Great, but yeah, very important point, Peter, thank you. So our next question is um, uh, related to that, uh, to the first question. Uh, Henry Stotts asked, I'd like to hear about ethical and legal concerns of using cracked uh, obsolete or legacy software for education purposes. So there's a good bit of older cracked software floating around on forgotten hard drives and even on present day torrents on the internet, so I hear. Uh, what are the ethical issues when preserving drives containing this material and what are the concerns of using uh, torrented software to access otherwise inaccessible files? Um, Krista, maybe you wanna start this time and, and Peter can pick up. Oh, or did we lose Krista? Well, I'll, let me jump in and Krista can, can follow. Um, the the sure. first part of the question, preserving the, the drives, takes us, I think, actually back to um, principles one and two. And that is to say, if, what one is doing is trying to just make sure that the material that is on that drive gets off that drive before something yeah. happens. To it, there are very few meaningful limitations other than the ones expressed in connection with principle one. If we're talking about using, in effect, found software from the drive or a drive in the collection or from some other source, then, and we will have more to say about this in a future episode, which focuses on the digital millennium copyright anti-circumvention provisions, but broadly speaking, there, we, the, both the software preservation worker and the beneficiaries of his or her work are in a very strongly advantaged position with respect to cracked software because significant exceptions for fair uses have now been affirmatively identified as exceptions to the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA. So again, more to come on that, but it's a very hopeful situation. And the fact that the, the, the hack or the crack has occurred in the past rather than taking place in the future is, as far as I can tell, not a relevant consideration. Thanks, Peter. Krista, anything to add to that? Hello. There you are. Hi. 
sorry. I just, um, I logged back in. It said my internet connection was unstable. And so I lost you for a bit. <laughs> oh, well, we're just, we're talking about um, sort of cracking, cracking software or finding cracked software um, and the uh, legal implications of that. Uh, and I think Peter just was saying, you know, we'll talk a lot more about this in a later episode, and that might be a good place to leave it. But there, there is lots of good news coming. Stay tuned. Um, but uh, Krista, if you wanted to add anything to that, I uh, wanted to give you a chance to jump in. No, I, I probably would have just said that um, please stay tuned for our episode on um, circumvention. And, and yeah. if you can't wait, if you absolutely have to know now, there is an appendix to the code which deals with this and which we, we worked on to try to make a, a, a clear explanation. There are actually several things in that appendix which we're going to talk about in more detail. Licensing first, but then at around page, um, what is it, of the document 22, there is a, a discussion of what we think is the state of the law with respect to what I will right now always in future call cracking. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and the, another good resource, and this will be the centerpiece of our next of our webinar on this issue. The um, the Berkman Center at Harvard, the law clinic there, put together a great summary of what those DMCA provisions mean and a kind of user's guide. Um, that gets um, even deeper than we were able to in the code into the details of that provision. So, can we put up? And you can find that. That's a we can. Yeah, that's a. Uh, if you go to the Software Preservation Network website under resources, there's a, a hit quick link, and we'll also dig that up and put it in the chat here in just a second. Um, and I'll just as we're approaching our last minute here, there was a nice add-on in the chat, which is I think sometimes it would be nice to actually preserve cracked and pirated software uh, as a as an artifact of the of the phenomenon of piracy, which we didn't get too deeply into that uh, in our discussions in developing the code, but sounds perfectly legitimate to me. It does to me as that well. Is. You know, one of the things that is the, the touchstone here in thinking about fair use is this notion of transformative purpose. Why are you doing it? And if you're collecting um, example, historic examples of software piracy, that's a classic, non-exclusive, but extremely um, suggestive example of a use for a transformative purpose. Excellent. Well, this is a good place to wrap it up then, I think. Um, we're at the top of our hour. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate you all being here. If you join us next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we'll talk about uh, working with source code and software licenses with our guest Dana Buchan of Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and my lovely colleague Lauren Work from here at the University of Virginia Libraries. Um, next week's episode will be facilitated by me uh, and Peter. And thanks again for joining us today. We will see you next time. Y'all have a good afternoon. <laughs>